Welcome to GBC Online, the online gathering of Gaimia Baptist Church. My name is Mark Rader. I'm the senior pastor here. And wherever you are gathered today, we're delighted that you're with us. We trust that whoever you're gathered with in whatever space that might be, you experience the unity of the Holy Spirit as we gather together, even in diverse locations, to hear from God. This service was recorded observing the latest government guidelines. As you join in today, we encourage you to do the same. Doing this demonstrates our commitment to being others focused and communicates our desire to care for other people's health. Over the next hour, we are going to worship, pray and laugh together, celebrate all God has done in and through us during May Mission Month. And we'll also be returning to our series in the book of Hebrews called Anchored, as Mark Rader, our senior pastor, looks at the anchor of perfect forgiveness. One of the challenges of going to church online is that it can end up feeling like entertainment rather than a chance to give God space in our lives. We can get distracted by all the many things that must get done in our homes. Can I invite you to be on purpose as you engage with this service today? You can't pause this video stream, so we encourage you to be intentional and make space to join in, leaving the distractions until later. I promise this will help you hear what God has to say to you. Standing to sing along with the worship might also feel a bit strange, but give it a go. Take up the invitations to pray, have a Bible with you and take notes. Invite the Holy Spirit to keep you focused. If you have younger children, Roxanne will be back with Kids Home later in our service. And there are also activities for them listed in the notes section. So if you haven't already, grab some paper, coloring pens or pencils and be ready for those. We'd love you to log in, upload a photo of yourself and be a part of the online chat as well. This stream of instant messages is a great way to be reminded that there are others joining in beyond our living room. You don't have to type much, but we'd love the chance to say hi and welcome you in person. And if you are trying to find information mentioned in the service, it's probably in the notes section found on this very webpage. So be sure to check there if you're not sure of something. 2020, what a year. If you could choose one word to describe your feelings or experience of this year, what would it be? Unexpected, challenging, heartbreaking, disrupted, or maybe it's been a reset for you. I'm curious to hear the one word that you would choose. So please share yours with our community on our GBC Facebook or Instagram posts asking this question today. Considering all that we are feeling, I want to share a short poem by Leslie Dwight, which gives a different perspective to this year. She says this, what if 2020 isn't canceled? What if 2020 is the year we've been waiting for? A year so uncomfortable, so painful, so scary, so raw, that it finally forces us to grow. A year that screams so loud, finally awakening us from our ignorant slumber. A year we finally accept the need for change, declare change, work for change, become the change. A year we finally band together instead of pushing each other further apart. 2020 isn't cancelled, but rather the most important year of them all. As we continue to face uncertainty and groundlessness, I'd like to pray that God and our GBC values will guide us together towards our true north in these uncharted waters. So let's take a deep breath. And let's ask this of God together. Let's pray. God, Creator, steady us, speak to us. Help us to be on purpose and do the things we can do in the spaces where we don't know how. Embolden us to be whole life learners who are committed to curiosity and humility as we face new challenges daily. Soften us to be big hearted, knowing that love, grace and generosity are the places that people feel safe to grow. Empower us to be others focused in seeking to serve the others you put in our lives above our own agenda. And inspire us to be trustworthy people who are consistent, safe, and emotionally appreciative of the others around us. We breathe in and out again. Our breath of life. In Jesus' name, guide us through this year. 
Amen. Today we get to worship together with songs recorded by our own worship team and selected for us by one of our worship leaders, Alexi Collins. So stand if you feel comfortable and join in as we worship our God as one voice. Praise our heart. 
Hi, everybody. Hi, Mac. Oh, hello there, everyone. Oh, Mac, it's great to see you. We haven't seen you for a little while. Oh, it's been in training. I can see you've got a really fancy hat on. Well, I'm trying to become a, mu a magician, not a musician. That's different. No, it is, isn't it? No, well, you got your hat. I can make people disappear. Watch this. Yep. See, you're all gone. Uh, Mac, I'm not really sure that's really working for you. Well, it works for me. You all went. No, exactly. So um, why are you trying to become a... Um, that's what I eat it. Um, why are you trying to become a magician? Well, I was talking to my intern and he wants to become nicer and softer and better. And I thought, I can do that by magic. Well, I'm not really sure that's uh, the way things work, but why don't, you, why don't you call your intern and we'll see. All right then, intern, intern, where are you? <gasps> it's intern Mark. Oh. Fantastic. All right then. So Mark, Mac tells me that you want to become like nicer and softer and kinder and, and all that kind of stuff. That's right and I'll need your help. Okay, so what do the boys and girls at home have to do? Well, I'm going to count to three and then you're going to clap. All right, so you, you, we're going to count to three. I will. And, and they're going to clap. And then what's going to happen? I'm going to make Mark softer and nicer. He's pretty nice already, really, but we'll, we'll give it a go. So you boys and girls ready at home, Mac will count to three and you're going to clap. All right, let's try it. All right, one, two, three. Oh, look at that. Oh, oh, well done. It is well done. Suddenly he's, he's got a, a giant teddy bear. That's right. But Mac, you told me that you were going to try and make Mark nicer and kinder and softer and sweeter and, and all that kind of stuff. But really, all you've done is, is give him a giant bear. Right. What's wrong with that? Oh, well, nothing's wrong with that. It's just not changing his heart or not changing him. It's just an extra bit of something that's added onto him. All right, let's try it again then. All right, so we're going to try it again because we want to try and change Mark to be nicer and kinder and softer and sweeter and, and lovelier. Uh, so we're going to try it again. All right, are you ready? I think they are. All right, one, two, three. Oh, oh, let's, oh, look at that. Oh, you're really good at this kind of quality, quality magic, oh, quality. <laughs> you've, you've kind of half turned him into something soft and, and cute and lovely. That's great. How much can a koala bear, hey? <laughs> well, actually, how much can a, a, a marsupial bear? Do you mean a Mark Supial? <laughs> Mark Supial. Oh, very funny. But um, you've kind of turned him half into a koala, but I'm not really sure he's softer or kinder or nicer or sweeter or anything on the inside. Right? Shall we try again? I think we might have to try again. So, boys and girls, let's try this one more time. All right, then. Off we go. One, two, three. Wow, look at that, look at that indeed. Oh, that's fantastic. I know, they're very good at clapping their hands and, and doing this. So Mac, what do you call a bear um, with no ear? Well, anything you like, because he can't hear you. Well, I was actually thinking a bear with no, no ear is called a buh. A buh. Well, that's not very funny. Yes, it is. It's hilarious. But the thing is, Mac, with all this magic that you're doing and, and getting the kids to do amazing clapping at home, you've changed Mark on the, on the outside. You've changed him into something that's so soft and cuddly and lovely and, and sweet that everybody wants to hang around and, and it's going to make the world a happier, better place. But you haven't actually changed his heart. You haven't changed the inside. Right? So... Should we try and turn him inside out? Is that what you want? No, that's not really what I want. No, I'm just saying that, that all you've done is really change his outside. But if you really want to change someone's heart, Mac, you actually need Jesus to do that. You need God to change our hearts. And I've got a great way to explain how God actually changes us from the inside out. All right then, all right then, I guess you'll have to clap one more time. One, two, three. Oh, look at that. That's fantastic. That is a giant, giant spoon. It sure is. Oh, wow. That is definitely a big spoon. So, Mac, the way that we change and the way that we become kinder and softer and sweeter and lovely and nice is actually we have to ask God. And we can actually use a teaspoon to help us remember how that happens. Does 
Does God hit us with a giant spoon? <laughs> what God does? Does he cut off our heart out with a giant spoon? No, that's not what God does either. Mac, teaspoon is actually spelt in recipe books. T-S-P. That's right, T-S-P. And we can re remember that it stands for thank you, sorry, and please. Right? So if we want God to change our hearts and to make us all those things that, that Mark wants to be and that we all want to be, then we can say to God, thank you. T, thank you, God, for sending Jesus to die on the cross, to save us for our sins, um, to, to be our saviour and our Lord and our friend. What do you thank you? And then we can say, I'm sorry, God, sorry for all the things that I've done, the things that maybe I, I should have done, but I didn't, the things that I did that I shouldn't have done. Well, I've got lots of those. Exactly, me too, me too, and God knows them, but we can say, I'm sorry, God, for doing all those things. And then we can say, please. Well, that's the T. That's right, please, we can say, please help us to live like you, to be like you, and so that we can be with you forever. Well, that's great. Oh, just, that's right, T-S-P, just, yeah. Well, let's just go with T-S-P. It's a little bit easier to say. And that is how God is going to change us from the inside out without any bears required. Oh, I still like bears. I still like bears too. Well, thank you so much. Oh, yes, thank you, Mark. You're a great intern, and thank you for being a Mark Supiel today. I think you did a great job being a Mark Supiel today. Um, and hopefully the kids at home and the mums and dads will remember to pray and to say thank you, sorry, and please for God to change their heart. All right, then, you stayed. You're a wee royal. I'll see you later. Off you go. See you later. Bye. <laughs>
so Lord, we come before you and we thank you for your mercy and your grace. And we pray that you would be present with us in the midst of uh, a lot of change and a lot of confronting um, realities in the world and in our neighborhood and in our personal lives. And I pray that you would help us to bring our attention to you, bring our focus back to you and your face and to uh, give over control to you. And we just pray this in Jesus name. Amen. If you have a prayer request, we would love to pray for you. Uh, so please submit a prayer request using the button on your screen. Um, and we uh, will, uh, one of our prayer team uh, will be taking the opportunity this week to pray for you. Thanks, Esther. Before we hear Mark's sermon today, let me remind you about the Big Three podcast. This midweek discussion addresses three big questions raised by you during our services and will get you thinking more deeply about how to apply the Bible's teaching. It's easy to be a part of this. Use your phone, hold your camera up to the QR code, which is on the screen now. This asks you if you want to visit the Slido website where you can ask any questions that you have during or after the sermon or you can get there by visiting slido.com and entering the code on the screen. You'll also be able to see other people's questions so that you can like and upvote them to be included in the big three. Then look out for the audio podcast wherever you listen to them or watch the video here on GBC Online on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. or after that on our YouTube channel. Right now, it's time for today's Bible passage from the start of Hebrews 10, read to us by David Commons. I encourage you to follow along. There's a Bible tab on your screen, if that's helpful. Well, very good morning, everyone. We're going to be diving into Hebrews chapter 10 this morning. I hope you can follow along. It's verses 1 through to 10. So let's strap ourselves in, and here we go. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they have not stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. By, and by that we will have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Well, after spending some time last week with Karina Kremensky from Neighborhood Matters, we're diving right back into the book of Hebrews, where we are coming to the conclusion of the main section of the letter. The author has, for a number of chapters, been alternating between some really strong warnings not to drift away from Jesus and some really extensive and deep teaching about how great Jesus is. And in chapters 9 and 10, he kind of culminates this argument. He has for a long time now in the book been speaking about Jesus as a high priest of a completely different order, someone of greater capacity, someone of uh, greater skillfulness, whose ministry is superior. 
And while there's a continuity, uh, Jesus' work is based on the same unchanging purpose of God to uh, set aside for himself a people who are his. Uh, While Jesus has a continuity with that same purpose, his ministry is based on a better promise to write the law of God on our hearts, which is the centerpiece of a better covenant. And in chapters 9 and 10, the author now moves to describe Jesus' superior forgiveness, his perfect, eternal, complete forgiveness. And even though our reading was from chapter 10, I want to go back to chapter 9 and just kind of give you some of the highlights of that section so you can kind of follow the line and argument that the author here is making. So in chapter 9, he has moved from the covenant and begins to talk about the superior ministry of Jesus. And he does so by beginning with the tabernacle the traveling tent that Moses and the people had constructed in the wilderness uh, according to the pattern of God and where God himself dwelt with his people. It is interesting that the author refers to the tabernacle rather than the temple. And there might be a couple of reasons for that. Uh, It might be that the temple by the time he was writing had been destroyed. So after 70 AD and therefore there was no longer a temple to speak of. Or he may simply have wanted to continue talking about the time of Moses. So much of the book has referred back to the wilderness generation, and that might be the motivation for it. But regardless, he talks about the outline of the, uh, the building, the layout of the tabernacle with its outer courtyard and the holy place and the most holy place and describes briefly some of the furniture culminating with a description of the Ark of the Covenant and what it contained. A reminder of God's provision in the golden jar of manna, a reminder of God's appointment of Aaron as the high priest from the tribe of Levi, and a reminder of God's unchanging purpose in the two tablets of the covenant. And then the author kind of leaves that to one side and focuses on one sacrifice that took place in the tabernacle. There were daily sacrifices and monthly sacrifices and there were rituals that took place at special times during the year. And the most special solemn of these was the Day of Atonement. You can read about it a little bit more in detail in Leviticus chapter 16. And the author has chosen this one offering, I think, for two reasons. First of all, It was the only offering that was given uh, and prepared and given to the Lord by the high priest alone. And it had to do with the covering over or atoning for sins. Once a year, the high priest would enter into the most holy place and there bring blood to atone for all the sins of the people for the past year. The sins that had been committed in ignorance, the things that had not been confessed, just kind of dealing with, it's kind of a a spiritual spring cleaning uh, that was good for the entire last year. And the author then kind of takes that one instance and says, you know what, this was a a parable, an illustration of what was to come. And he says, in Jesus, our great high priest, he has uh, done something much more significant than the high priests in the Old Testament ever could have done. They had to repeat the offering year after year after year after year because the sins of the people remained. So this is one of the things that the offerings were never able to do. The blood of rams and goats could not take away sin. But Jesus, as our great high priest, has entered not into the tabernacle, certainly not the earthly one, nor did he enter the the inner areas of the temple in Jerusalem. Ironically, he was not allowed to enter into the very presence of God while he was in Jerusalem. But instead, in his death, he has entered into the real, true, spiritual temple, the the tabernacle of God himself, where God dwells, and has brought not the blood of goats and rams and sheep and bulls, but his own blood, and has won for us a perfect forgiveness, a perfect forgiveness. Forgiveness, an eternal and complete forgiveness, which is, of course, of enormous significance. It's almost like if you've ever printed off a document, a, you know, a report or an essay, in order to just kind of go over it and edit it one more time uh, in, with a physical copy. 
and you've taken the physical copy and you've got your red pen and you've underlined the bits that aren't particularly grammatical and you've crossed out additional words and circled the spelling mistakes and all those sorts of things, and then you've gone and pressed print again, you will only perpetuate the same mistakes again and again and again. The, the Old Testament Day of Atonement was printing off the copy and making all the corrections again. And what Jesus has done is he's gone into the master copy and actually made eternal changes, permanent changes, so that everything that follows is now completely and utterly different. And, and this perfect forgiveness has, I think, some really significant and enormous implications for us. It's why this is at the very end of his argument. He's arguing and, and, and trying to convince and persuade and uh, cajole and warn his readers not to drift away from Jesus. And ultimately, this is why. Because the perfect forgiveness that Jesus has won for us has three really important outcomes for us. First of all, it has made obsolete the offerings and sacrifices of the Old Testament. In chapter 10, uh, when the, the author is quoting Psalm 40, he actually makes this statement from that psalm. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. And it might be worth just pausing there just for a moment, because it does raise the question, why would God ask them to do a bunch of sacrifices if they didn't actually please him? And I want to just return to the idea of the heart and worship. Uh, the sacrifices and offerings were not, uh, in the Old Testament, magical. Magic works on this principle, that if I get the right ingredients and uh, say the right words in the right order at the right time, then something must happen. And so the offerings weren't magical. It wasn't as if if you did the ritual in the right way and sprinkled the blood in the right places and said the right words that God had to forgive you. God is as gracious in the Old Testament as he is in the New. And the offerings and the sacrifices were symbolic of his willingness to forgive. But there's also an implication for the worshiper. One of the constant complaints of the prophets in the Old Testament is that the people had begun to treat the offerings and sacrifices a little bit like magic. That if they just simply did them, that was enough. The prophet Isaiah laments on behalf of the Lord and says that the name of the Lord is always on their lips, but he is far from their hearts. And when your heart is disengaged from wanting to approach God, the sacrifices and offerings become meaningless and they are no longer pleasing to him at all. What is pleasing is what the psalmist goes on to say when Jesus comes and says, I have come to do your will. And so Jesus has made obsolete all of the sacrifices and the offerings and in order that God and his people might be brought together without that symbol. In essence, what Jesus has done is he has brought us not even into the, the most holy place of the tabernacle, but into the heavenly throne room, as he'll go on to say, where you and I have access to God and have been made, even as we are being made, holy. Because to be in the presence of the Holy One requires that we be holy. And Jesus has won a perfect and complete forgiveness. And we have access to the very throne room of God where we can ask for all that we need. This is where we come back to that language of patrons and clients. And I have to admit, I've been using those terms wrong and talking about patrons and benefactors, and they're the same thing. It's patrons and clients. And we are the clients who have been brought into the presence of God to ask for all that we need, all that we require, all that is fit and appropriate. But secondly, Jesus's perfect eternal forgiveness also provides for us and enables for us a life of true worship. And this is d different from what worship is when we gather together. Uh, this is a life of worship. And you may have heard me say this before, but we worship what we fear controls our destinies. Uh, and a life of worship is when we bring our lives, our heart and soul and mind and strength, as the Bible says, into alignment with what we worship. People who worship money don't have a shrine to it in their homes, but instead they have begun to believe that money controls their destiny, 
that money provides them with the good life, with security, with assurance, with importance, and with blessing. And they turn their heart and soul and mind and strength to ally with the values and priorities of money. And because Jesus has promised to rewrite our hearts, because he has gone into the the, the computer and he has actually made the corrections because he has actually begun to write the law on our hearts so that it is internalized. We are free to begin to turn to God fully and allow our lives to become aligned to his, to his values, to his priorities, to his will. And every area of our life becomes part of our overall expression of worship. Jesus' eternal, perfect forgiveness not only ushers us into the presence of God, but it also enables us to live the life that God has always designed for us and that we desperately want for ourselves. And all of this leads to, I think, perhaps the most significant. And that is that Jesus' eternal forgiveness allows us to develop a relationship with God that is characterized by freedom, by love, and by joy. I mean, there's something really quite significant about the fact that Jesus does not push us into the presence of God. Jesus has not given us a new law to push us towards God. Instead, what he has done is he has gone before us and removed all the obstacles. He hasn't just unlocked the front door of the, the, the throne room of God. He hasn't even opened the door. He's torn the door and the frame and most of the wall out, put a great big welcome mat, and there's a sign that says, any friend of Jesus is, is a friend of mine. God. We are free to enter into the presence of God. There are no more obstacles for us. And can I just point out then that this has some really important implications for confession. You see, so often we confess in order to receive forgiveness. That's how it works in relationships, right? I confess something to you. I tell you something that I've done. I, I kind of come clean on something. And, and I do that in order that we might make it right between us. Uh, and, and I don't know how you're going to respond. You might be upset. You might be angry. It might have some really significant implications for our relationship. And so confession in a human relationship is often accompanied by fear. But if Jesus has already won our forgiveness, an eternal perfect forgiveness for all of our sins, past, present, and future, then we are not confessing in order to receive forgiveness we are confessing because we have forgiveness. We confess to acknowledge where our lives are out of alignment, where things are out of whack, where, you know what, we're not actually living out the values and the priorities of the one in whose presence we now stand. It's almost as if because we have been forgiven, we can kind of pull each sin out of our back pocket and say, is this forgiven? And Jesus says, yes. And we go, okay, what about, what about, what about this one? Uh, yes, that too. Uh, what about this one? I've got loads more. Are, are all of these forgiven? And there's freedom in that. A freedom that keeps us anchored to the very throne room of God. But it's a relationship with God that's also then uh, characterized by love. A love that comes from having internalized the law because Jesus is writing it on our hearts where our decisions to do the right things, to do the things that are in alignment with the ways of God come from a desire to do so rather than because we have been told to do so. And there is an enormous difference between those. And a relationship with God that is marked not only by freedom, not only by love, but also by joy. And this is the joy of an unexpected windfall. Even if you weren't alive when this happened, you have no doubt heard the story because it has gone into Australian legend. And it's the story or the legend of Stephen Bradbury. You know the story, don't you? A long time short track speed skater from Australia who in 2002 unexpectedly won the gold medal. The other three competitors in that final heat all wiped out in the last corner and he cruised past them to win gold. And if you've never seen a picture of his face, you've only just heard the story, look it up. He has his arms raised and the look on his face is of stunned delight. 
Now, he is filled with the joy of victory, but also overwhelmed at just how unexpected it was. And to some degree, it's that joy. It's almost a comic joy, not comical in the sense of funny, but comedy in, 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 in the grandest sense of it. Right? The happy ending. You and I are chumming it with God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit standing around in the very throne room of God, being able to ask the Father for whatever we need. And if that doesn't bring a stunned expression to our face, I don't know what will. There is something just totally unexpected that you and I would end up there. And that you and I would end up being so close to, to God. There's something incredibly joyful about where we have found ourselves and why would we ever want to drift away. And all of this, I think, then leads to, I'm going to call them two and a half points of application. The first of them is this. Given that Jesus has won for us and we have received by faith an eternal, perfect forgiveness, confess your sins to him. Confess your sins without fear without worry about wrath or anger, because that has already been taken care of. That has already fallen on Jesus. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father as the one who had come to do his will, saying to the Father, this one is a friend of mine. And the Father turns to us with benevolence and grace and mercy and compassion and all that we need. So confess your sins. Your weaknesses, your failures, your folly, the places you have transgressed, right? the places where you have trespassed. Uh, confess the things that you have done that have been wrong and the things that you have failed to do that were right. Confess whatever is in you in thought, word, and deed. Ask the Holy Spirit to shine a spotlight on that stuff that you can bring it all to him because it has all been forgiven. Take some time to confess not in order to receive forgiveness, but because you have been forgiven. Secondly, given that we are in the very presence of God, not even the, the earthly copy of the Holy of Holies, but the heavenly reality, ask for what you need. Let our prayers go beyond just the, the simple things that consume our lives as important as they can be. But let us ask for what we truly need to persevere and, and to, to stay close to Jesus. Pray for courage. Pray for diligence. Pray for love. Pray for transformation. Pray the big prayers. Ask for the main resources, the things that are most important for you to achieve all that Jesus has called you into. And here's the Here's the half. Along with asking for all that we require, can you ask the Holy Spirit to just give you a little bit of an insight into just how comic it is that you are where you are? And again, I don't mean comic in the sense of comical and funny and trite, but just how utterly unexpected it is, how incredibly joyful it is, so that you and I might perhaps, in our times of prayer, in our times of worship, in our times with our, our life groups, in our times with those around us, have that look upon our face that's a little bit reminiscent of Stephen Bradbury. Uh, just a little bit stunned and really excited and overwhelmed at where we have found ourselves. So confess your sins. Bring it all to the Father. Ask him for all that you need. And may we be given an insight into the joy of our salvation. That our relationship with God, marked by joy and love and freedom, that the access that we have, the forgiveness that we have been given might become the very bedrock of our relationship with God and our witness to the world around us. In order that, as the author will go on to say one more time, we do not drift away, but remain anchored to Jesus.
In response to what we've just heard, let's come before God and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to take time to confess our sins and realign ourselves with your will for our lives. As it says in Psalm 139, search me God and know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, we thank you that we can live life to the full in relationship with you because the perfect sacrifice of Jesus brings complete forgiveness. But Lord, we know that we continue to fail in developing the fruit of the Spirit that you invite us to grow in our lives. Lord, change our hearts, we pray. Amen. Here are five questions that I find helpful to reflect on. After the questions, we will pause for a minute and I will invite you to pray silently. And after that, I will close in prayer. as we bring our sin before you. We also thank you for your great mercy and love. Help us to be ambassadors of joy, showing others what it's like to live in the victory that you have won. Amen. In Christ alone my hope is found he is my life my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still and striving cease my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I sing. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless space. Gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ.
few weeks we've been hearing about different organisations and people we've been supporting through May Mission Month. Before we committed to going ahead with it we were really mindful that a global pandemic was unfolding. After all things were considered we chose to proceed with May Mission Month in a spirit of faith rather than fear. Our target this year was $190,000 and will you join me in a drum roll wherever you are before I announce our total. Our total for May Mission Month 2020 is $247,000 raised by the GBC community. How awesome is that? And the great thing is that it's going to help incredible organisations and people on the ground. Thank you so much for your redonkulously big-hearted generosity and for being on purpose to love other people in these very challenging times. We'll have updates on our projects later in the year, but let's celebrate that we exceeded our target and we'll see lives changed by Jesus. Also, can you believe it? We've been doing GBC online together as a community for three months now. And as we move towards our new normal, can I encourage you to get connected to our different communication channels, which will keep you up to date with the life of our faith community. We have our GBC social media platforms of Facebook and Instagram that you can follow. And you can also subscribe to our GBC YouTube channel or GBC eNews, which comes out weekly via email. All the info and links are in our notes tab for you so you can take the next step to connect. And finally, you've probably seen the responses across the globe to the death of George Floyd and the resulting demonstrations against systemic racism and injustice. In light of these events, our senior pastor, Mark Rader, has released a reflection on racism and our response to it through a biblical and theological framework. If you'd like to engage with this resource, it's available on our GBC YouTube channel. By one sacrifice, Jesus has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Jesus has made us perfect in God's sight and that brings us extraordinary freedom. It's a truth that anchors us. Thank you for joining in with this service. We've loved having you here. As we close, I invite you to receive this blessing. May Almighty God remind us of the forgiveness that frees us as we are anchored by Jesus and empowered by his Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll see you next week. Turn.